What's up guys? Welcome to the quarantine. I'm your host Wolf and today I'm going to be taking a look at a small game that you may have heard of called Scythe by Stonemaier Games. Now Scythe plays one to five players and it says it plays in about 115 minutes which is odd because it's five minutes shy of two hours but I'd say it's about accurate between two to three hours is what you're looking at. Now Scythe is an area control uh, resource management alternate history Central Europe game. Now, there's a couple caveats that I have to say before I go ahead and review. Of course, the normal one, uh, this is a review. It is not a tutorial, so especially for this one, there are a lot of rules that I'm just going to kind of gloss right over. And the other one is, the learning curve for this game goes like this, and then comes back down. It's super simple to play once you've grasped the initial learning curve. So, I'm, there is no way I'm going to be able to cover all of the rules. Now, over on Watch It Played, they do have a full video on Scythe, very descriptive how to play it. Uh, if you want to know all the little nuances, nuance rules and everything, give them, a, give them a look. But this is just a review, and it should give you a good idea if this game is for you. So let's just go straight over to the... All right. This is basically Scythe set up for the most part. Now the only thing I didn't do is I did not grab my six coins that I'm supposed to start with. Now, you will see I do have the collector's edition that has metal coins because I am a sucker for metal coins. And I also have the fancy uh, resource uh, resources. So like that's wood and I have you know the drums of oil, so on and so forth. However, the base game is going to have uh, little wooden little wooden black things that look like this big kind of look like oil tanks the wood is going to look like little pieces of wood stuff like that so your components may not look this uh, as good as these ones uh, unless you pick up the collector's edition but so that's another little caveat I should probably throw out there and again there's no way I'm going to be able to cover every rule this video will take like 30 to 45 minutes if so if it doesn't already take that much but what you're seeing here, the game is basically going, is how the game basically is going to be set up. Uh, each player, let me go ahead and pull this off here, each player is going to randomly be dealt one of the five factions. There are two that are not used yet or for expansions, so you're going to randomly get dealt one of these. Then each player is going to get a bottom board, a player board, randomly as well. You're going to get, put all of your stuff in these boards. As you see, as you see here, everything. Keep bumping the bumping the camera here. Everything you see here fits perfectly in it. So let's just go ahead and zoom in. If my camera wants to cooperate here, there we go. So as you see there, everything fits very well. If you look here, everything is indented. So basically, if it fits, that's pretty much where it's going to go. You're not going to put anything down here into these red squares, and I'll explain why shortly. So let's go ahead and zoom this back out so you can see the board here. Now, the game has been very hyped, and we'll see if that's worth the hype. Uh, the player is going to start out in their home base, as you see up here. I have uh, my little li uh, tiger up here, and then two workers. Throughout the game, what you're going to do is you're going to take your little pawn here and you're going to place it in one of these four sections. And when you place it in the section, you can do the top part, the bottom part, both, or none. So what you're going to do is, let's say I'm going to uh, move. So what you're going to do, and if you may or may not be able to see, I'll just show you here. If we look at the move action on this board, with this one would be covered because it's got the little indentation, so you'd have a cube over it. It shows two little dudes in two different boxes, so that means two different units can move one hex. So I'm going to move a worker here and my hero there. And then it's going to go back around and it's going to come to me again. Now I've already done move, so now I have to do a different action, one of these three instead. Unless you are the red faction and their little player power that shows up here says that they may choose the same uh, the same space more than once. So I can just keep moving, moving, move, 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 move the whole game. There's nothing anybody can do about it. But 
that's not as good of a power as you may think it is. But anyway, so let's say, then I'll go to Bolster. Now if you look at the player board, we'll go pull this one up here. If it shows something in red, that means that's what you have to pay. So in order for me to Bolster, because what you need for each area from here up is the same on each board. They're just in different orders and the cost for everything and what the reward for everything down here which I'll get to is going to be different on each board. So each one of these boards are a little bit different. So I'm going to bolster and if you see here as I showed you bolster you have to pay one coin so you would uh, oh I threw it back in here didn't I? So I started the game with six coins so I'm going to take one of these and throw it back in there and then I bolster. Now bolster shows two little it'll be like this shows two little shields with wings so that means oh I have these backwards uh, right here so that means I'm gonna go up boom boom two and I'll get to what powers for and then so on and so forth and again I'm not gonna go over what each one of these little actions down here can do my camera does not want to adjust there we go I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of detail about what all these things do uh, however the one thing I will get into is Throughout the course of the game, you'll, you might be able to place more workers. And as you do, you're going to uncover more things that you have to pay for. So, as you see here, I cannot get these back in here. But as you see here, first time that I do uh, produce, I'm not going to have to pay anything. But you have different symbols on the board, as you may see here. Like this looks like a little meeple. This looks like a little bag of wheat, this looks like iron, this looks like a drum of oil, um, this looks like wood. So whenever I produce, I'm going to choose two hexes and I will produce one of the type of, up to one of the type of resource for each worker present. So r these two workers that I have are on a farm which shows a meeple and an oil field. So if I choose those two, I will get one oil field and then because that shows a meeple, I can pull one person off here because I have one worker. If I had three workers there I can pull three of them off. So if you kinda get the idea. So if I had three workers on the oil field if I chose that hex as the um, one of the ones to produce I would wind up getting, oh and there goes an oil, I would wind up getting three oil fields out there. Now I should probably note, let's put this back up here, I should probably note that resources stay on the board because if an opponent enters a hex that has your resources on it and you know you wind up losing a battle or your your uh, farmers or workers retreat have to retreat off the hex they gain control of those resources to be able to spend so you wind up getting a cold war that happens more often than not in this game uh, this game is more about the threat of being attacked versus actually being attacked now I don't know if you can see up here all right, up here, throughout the course of the game, you're going to be able to accomplish different um, uh, objectives. So you have all six objectives, all four, or all six objectives have been created, or not objectives, all six upgrades have been created, all four mechs have been placed, all four buildings have been placed, all four uh, recruits have been placed, uh, all four workers have been placed, your mission has been completed, two combats have been won, uh, 18 popularity, which is up here, or 16 power. If you ever achieve one of those, you're going to take one of these stars and you will put it on whatever it is that you accomplish. Once one person places their sixth star out, the game is immediately over. Now, and then at the end of the game, you are going to tally up uh, however much coins you have. Whoever has the most coins is the winner. So that means throughout the course of the game, when you're doing things like bolstering, and trading you're spending points in order to do these things so you have to think very carefully how badly you actually need these so that's overall the basic how the game kinda works now I'm gonna go into a little detail of just kinda scattered rules um, you have these little markers here exploration markers which I didn't put the tokens out but they're tokens that'll be sitting in the middle of the board on these spaces that have the symbol and if you're a hero and only your hero, I mean, anybody else could be there as well, but only if your hero enters a, a space with that, you're allowed to draw one of these cards, and you're going to pick one of these events. 
Now, generally speaking, the events are just get a little bit for free, pay a little to gain a little more, or pay a lot and gain a lot. Uh, and then you have a little really, really nice art behind it. And there's no kind of, there's no text or flavor of text or anything like that because you're supposed to use the picture to create your own scenario. So like, uh, we'll choose the second one. Hire the builders for the day. So you maybe stumbled across all these guys and you go and hire them for a day. So you pay three to build, just build a structure for free. Well, not for free, but you get the idea. You didn't have to spend an action to do it. Or all the wood, which is even more of a pain sometimes. Um, then you have like the factory right here in the middle. If your hero ever enters the factory, uh, it counts for three hexes for the purpose of endgame scoring, which I'll get to. And then these cards over here, which I think were off camera, you're going to have one of these, uh, equal, uh, one plus one for each player. No, let me rephrase that. You're going to have one for each player plus one. There we go. That's what I was trying to get to. So I just put three out. And whenever you enter the the factory with the hero, you're going to be able to look at these, and you get to choose one. And you only ever get to have one of these. But later on down the road, if somebody else enters it, they get to basically have the scraps that are left over, and they can choose one. Now, what do these do? These are a effectively a fifth option on your player board. So on your player board, you're going to pretty much put this to the right, and that's now a new action that you're going to be allowed to do. So, for example, this one... You can pay two coins and just get a building and just get a uh, popularity. Boom. That's awesome. So you would go ahead and get that, put that off to the side, and then that's now just a cool little thing you're able to do from now on. Um, and that's basically the game. You have a few end game scoring modifiers, like uh, you have these tiles that are going to be random. There's, what, eight of them, six of them, something like that. You know, shuffle them up and you could put them out. So, for example, this, for every building that you have that's built adjacent to an exploration tile, so like this, you're going to get extra gold, which, remember, are points. So, you only have four buildings, and it's only possible for you to have it built next to uh, up to seven due to the way these are spread out. So, if you have, you have them spread out and built perfectly, you're going to get nine points just for completing this. Then, at the end of the game, depending on where you are on this little track here, depends on how your end game modifiers are going to go. So, for example, let's say I'm right here on nine, because I'm you have three brackets. You have here, here, and here. So I'm in the middle bracket. So for every star that I have placed up here, I would be getting four coins. For every hex that I control. I'll be getting three, keeping in mind the factory counts as three hexes by itself. So, early and mid-game, there's not really a re there's a reason to get to the factory, but there's no reason to actually hold it, um, unless you just don't want everybody else getting access to it. Uh, but other than that, you go in, generally one person's going to rush the factory just so they can get access to those cards, because some of those cards are excellent. So I should also probably point out, if you notice, the bottom of it says has two guys, but they're locked in one hex. So that means one guy gets to move two hexes instead, and that is really, really good sometimes. Maybe get uh, your your hero right where they need to be or something. I've actually won a game because of it. But, um, anyways, so three for every uh, hex that you control. Now, control means you have either a hero, a worker, a building, or a mech in that location. If you have any one of those, you control that hex. And then you're going to get, in this scenario, I would get two coins for every two resources still left on the board at the end of the game. Because uh, throughout the course of the game, if you ever have to spend resources, you would pull them off of hexes that you control and toss them in here. Now, there's again, there's millions of other things that I can explain with the game. And it is a pain to teach for like the first two, two turns or so, two rounds. Generally, everybody kind of gets it afterwards. There's just a dump truck of information you have to get. Now, when you build mechs, let me kind of angle this down down here. If you notice, when you on the mech board here, there we go. Let's just get this angled here. On the mech board, when you lift this up, there's text underneath it. So this says, 
that you can move across rivers and to move across rivers to farms and villages. And you know each faction has unique ones. The uh, one in the front is always going to be a river run, river crossing ability. It's just what you're able to cross and do is going to be different. And then the last one is always going to be additional movement. So if you unlock this one, your move is going to be two different things can move two hexes. So that means if you have the factory, one thing gets to move three hexes, which is insanity. Now, any of these powers that you unlock also give the bonus to your hero and your mech. So your hero will benefit from any of those that happen as well. But let's go ahead and zoom back out. So if you notice, uh, the little starting areas, because these are the home bases, and if you look at the starting areas, they're surrounded by rivers. So for the first few rounds of the game, you're not really going to be able to leave your little area. So it may behoove you to try to build this first mech as soon as possible. Now, you don't have to build them in order. You can build them in whatever order you want. But just know, unless you have another way to get off of your little peninsula, you're, not, you're going to be stuck there. Now, there's a few other things. You have mines, these little hexes here. They're all connected. So if I, my hero was here and I had a movement of one, I could move all the way over to this mine if I wanted to. Uh, the buildings that you have, the mine, acts as though one of those. Uh, I'm not going to touch into what all the different buildings do. I'll let you figure that out on your own. Uh, but that is, as far as I can remember, that is really the meat and potatoes of this game. The last thing I do need to touch on, which... This has gotten a lot of grief, and I don't know why, but there is the combat system. You're going to be climbing up and down this little power meter throughout the course of the game. If you ever get 16, of course, you get a star. But what's going to happen is if I, either my mech or my hero, enters a hex that has enemy units in it. Uh, by units, that is a hero or a mech. If there's workers, I'll touch on what, that hap what happens there, but... If I enter a hex with a worker, or a, not a worker, sorry, a hero, or a mech, then I engage in combat. And what's going to happen is, these little combat cards that you get, you are going to take this little wheel, and you're going to bid as much power as you would like. Now, of course, you can only bid up to what you have, or seven is the max. And then you get to play one card per unit in that combat. So if I have three mechs and they have one, I'm going to get to play up to three of these cards. They can only play one. So I'll bid, you know, in, in my situation here, I have six power. So I'm going to bid three, and then I'm going to take this card and kind of tuck it back behind here. And you're allowed to do this secretly, like under the table or whatever. Your opponent doesn't even know, need to know you played a card. So like from the back, you can't tell. And then once you both say, okay, I'm ready, you'll go ahead and reveal and tally the numbers. So in this case, I have six and then he would tally his numbers. Whoever has the most numbers wins. In the loser from the combat, uh, their units are going to be removed from the board and put back on their base, home base location. Meaning that could be huge and could really screw up some, uh, some plans. Uh, the tie, if there's a tie, it will always go to the attacker. Now, if I enter in a location that has a worker, so let's say this isn't my worker, and I enter into it, What's going to happen is the worker is immediately going to be teleported back to the home base of the appropriate player, and then you're going to lose one popularity for every worker that was there. However, you now control those resources, so let's say it was here. Now I control all three of those oil drums. Now, also one last thing here, and I know I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but like I said, there's a lot that, that to cover with this game. When you move, if I move my worker... Uh, or only workers can, um, workers or mechs, if I move them, you can move any number of resources with them as well. Uh, mechs are allowed to carry workers, so by extension they can also carry uh, resources. So you can go, you know, I'm going to go one, carry this worker with him, and then my second move, because I have to choose a different unit, I'm going to take this worker, move him back here, and maybe bring a couple oil drums with him, just in case. And that really is the meat and potatoes of Scythe. There, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more rules 
and you know really cool things like some of these buildings do neat things and you have recruiting where you take these and you put them up here and get immediate benefits and and then now if anybody does this action to your left and your right then you get a cool bonus so you're able to use what they're using and doing against them and stuff like that but that should give you a basic idea of how scythe plays so let's go ahead and just move on to my final thoughts shall we all right scythe well if you haven't heard scythe is probably the single most anticipated game of 2016 in, in board game community anyways so does it live up to that hype yeah yeah i would say honestly it does um and I'm sorry I didn't go over all the rules. Like I mentioned, Watch It Played has an excellent video uh, with those rules. So check them out. Watch It Played, Scythe, and YouTube should pull it up, no problem. Um, but the, the game, if you notice when I was pointing out those little stars, one of my favorite aspects of the game is you only benefit from combat twice. And what I didn't mention with combat is when, whatever you bid, you lose permanently. So... Combat is very costly, unless you're not going for power, but then you also need power for other things, like to produce, probably, if you have more than, like, three or four workers out. So, war battles don't happen very often, you know. Even taking things from peasants is costly, because that costs you your population, and that could be really bad. And you wind up just getting a cold war, because where all your resources stay on the table it gets really tense when you're stockpiling up all of these resources to try to, you know, maybe you have a mission that says you need to, or, you know, you just want to stock them up for points at the end game. But then the guy next to you starts building up mechs somewhat close, or maybe moving them next to you and you start getting all paranoid, you're like, dude, what? Whoa. You start looking at their river walkability, but like, okay, can they get over here? No, they, they can't get over here. All right, they'll have to go all the way around, so I'll have time, okay. And so it allows you to start planning, but it's it gets really tense. Now, with two and three players, I haven't played it before, but with two and three players, the game is okay. Uh, I recommend if you're going to play it uh, two or three players, make sure both or all three players are factions right next to each other. Um, especially two players is bad. If you get somebody on the other side, you're really just playing a solo game at that point. Uh, there's very, very little player interaction uh, from what we've found. But five players is where this game shines because it's very tense and you're constantly looking around the board and going, all right, what are they going to do? Okay, they haven't fought at all or so, and they're marching over here and so on and so forth. So it's really cool. And then like the black faction, um, I, the Saxons, I think they're, they are, they can benefit from combat and missions any number of times. So they can complete both of their missions, which I didn't mention each player gets two mission cards. Um, but they can complete both of their missions and just keep fighting people and win. Uh, but again, it's very costly. So that's not as good of a benefit as it sounds like it is. And it just gets really tense. And what a friend of mine had mentioned is it feels like a better Terra Mystica. And it, that's very accurate. Of course, there's way more to it than Terra Mystica. But it feels like a better Terra Mystica, like he mentioned. And just the fact that, you know, the resources that stay on the field. And then the art. Holy crap, the art is amazing. Uh, this is, aside from Kingdom Death, I would say this is probably the best art that I've seen in a game. Kingdom Death still trumps all of it. Whoever, the guy Adam Poots has doing his art, holy hell, that man can draw but this game has probably the second best art in a board game that I've seen a um, lot of little fiddly components though so that will turn a lot of people off um, but overall the game is amazing another downfall from the game though that uh, my brother doesn't like is it does have end game scoring uh, my brother has a hard time he can strategize and do all these things but when it comes to remembering, keeping track of what everybody's in-game scoring is, he has a hard time doing that. And I know a lot of people who are like that that just don't like in-game scoring. When you'll jump from, like, 15 points, suddenly you have 75 points just because you played everything right and you built an efficient engine that just ended very efficient. And where my brother's the opposite. Throughout most of the last game we played, he had a stack of coins. Like, I thought for sure he was going to win. 
he wound up placing last, and I won, which was weird because I had I was juggling like three coins throughout the whole game, and then suddenly I jumped up to like I think forty two points or something like that, just due to how I had myself spread out, the resources that I had, and the objective, the number of stars that I had put out, and stuff like that. So it has a if you're not into games that do that. Scythe may not be for you because that every game I've played, that's how it everybody jumps up huge amounts of points. And if you have a hard time keeping track of that, you're probably not going to enjoy Scythe. But if that's not a problem with you and you like games like that, because I love those, because it it makes me have to think more. Go okay, they have that many coins. All right, they're in this many places. They have this many. Okay, so this is what I need to do to be able to win and hope nobody screws it up. Because there's a little bit of player interaction. That's probably the only, the other downfall from the game is there's very, very, very little player interaction most of the time. Sometimes it dials up to 11 and gets tense. But overall, what other people are doing isn't really going to affect you that much. You're watching everybody, because again, it, it feels more like a Cold War, but they're not really affecting you. The last problem that I kind of have, and I don't really want to call it a problem, is the combat. A lot of people are complaining about the combat in Scythe. And as you know, if you've watched my video for Spiral Empires, the game I'm designing, um, I like deterministic combat. I do not like luck in combat. I hate the fact that I could have planned everything out, strategized everything, and then rolled like crap and I lost. And that drives me crazy. Whereas deterministic combat rewards for thinking and, and thinking ahead and, and making sure all your ducks in a row, I guess, you, is a good way to explain. And scythe combat is very similar to that. Uh, it is very deterministic. It could have been better, yeah, but honestly, I really, really like the way it works because it gives you a benefit for ganging up on one. You get to play each car, each uh, unit in the battle, get to have a card to it. So it gives you an advantage. And then there's that hard ceiling where, it, regardless, you can have 16 uh, power. You still can only bed 7. So you and me, you know, you at 16 and me maybe at 8 or 9, I still have a decent chance at winning a combat against you. Unless, of course, you gang up on me. But, like I said, that that's strategy and I'm not getting into that. So the combat I actually enjoy quite a bit. It could have been refined maybe... But even then, I, I like the combat just how it is. I think if anything, rather than the little dial, maybe each player could have had cards that they would play one face down or something. Just because that dial having to get cards back up behind it, I, I fear that over time that's going to damage the cards or maybe damage the wheel. Um, but other than that, those are really the only complaints that I have about Scythe. The game is outstanding. I've thoroughly enjoyed every game that I've played. Uh, one of my friends, uh, last game we played, not last game, but last game he played, he got, I screwed him over hard. And I felt kind of bad by it, but it was the optimal move I could have done. Like, I looked at the board, and I was like, oh, he's left himself open, and I'm going to be able to score a lot of points if I can hold on to doing this. And a big thing going on in my mind. And I screwed him over big time, and he was a little a little annoyed. But he still really enjoyed the game. It's the actual overall game is just that good, and it's so balanced from the, the uh, probably seven or eight games that I've played total. It feels very balanced. Now, I'm going to caveat real quick. The solo game, not going to delve too much into this. The solo game feels really good, and I don't really know how to explain it. It feels good, but it feels unfair. So, like, it's a way to play. And the Animus cards, or Anima cards, or whatever they're called, they work well, and it allows you to play properly. But the it's really hard to explain how the AI works. It works more like a blob, whereas you have these specific rules on how you're able to move things. The AI basically just becomes a blob that just spreads out over the entire map, and, of course, you get points for controlling hexes. So that's what they try to do is just, like, blob over the whole map. And it's really hard. I mean, maybe I'm terrible at it. That's totally possible. But 
From the experience that I've had, I've only played two games against it. One easy and one normal. Pardon me. And one normal, I've lost both times. Badly. Like, by ten or more points. And it's just really hard to keep up with the, the AI sometimes. But, again, maybe I'm not playing right. I don't know. But that is my review for Scythe. I highly, highly recommend getting it. Uh, I mean, of course, you don't need the collector's edition. I'm just a sucker for metal coins. Um... But pick it up. I think the base game is going to be 75 or something like that when it comes out. Definitely pick it up if you like this type of game. Fantastic. If you're not sure, play a friend's and you'll probably fall in love with it. I, I promise you. I haven't played this with anybody who didn't like it. So anyways, uh, that is my review for Scythe. If you like the channel, support me on Patreon. I'll have a link down in the description. You can give me a like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time in the quarantine.